Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters. There are over a billion and a half Muslims around the world. Muslims occupy almost every country on the map today. And it's truly remarkable when you think about it, because we're talking about a religious movement that began 14 centuries ago under the leadership of the Holy Prophet, whereby the entire Ummah was only made up of three individuals. There was a time in the history of Islam where the entire Ummah was made up of Rasulullah, Khadija, and Ali ibn Abi Talib. And the odds were heavily stacked against them. There were many times, especially during the Meccan period, where the future was very bleak for this small religious movement. But you find that Islam continues to grow year after year. In fact, statistics show that Islam today remains the fastest growing religion in the world. And in the year 2050, Islam will have more adherents and followers than even Christianity. But you find that the verse that I began with, in Surah At-Tawbah, verse 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually gives glad tidings to the Holy Prophet and to all Muslims that one day, eventually there will come a day when Islam will prevail over all religions. And I'm not talking about the Saudi version of Islam. I'm not talking about the Islam of Taliban or Daesh. I'm talking about the Islam of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I'm talking about the authentic, the unadulterated, the genuine Islam of the Ahlul Bayt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because if you look at the world today, even though Islam has a billion and a half followers and it will become the, it will have the largest adherence in the year 2050, the fact remains that the majority of the world today is non-Muslim. That Islam is not the dominant culture in the world. We're still a minority. But the Qur'an in ayah number 33 from Surah At-Tawbah highlights and prophesizes that Islam will one day be embraced by the overwhelming majority of humanity. In fact, when Imam al-Baqir salawatullahi alayhi when he was asked about this ayah, surah number 9, ayah number 33, the Imam alayhi salam, he says, Inna dhalika yakunu inda khuruj al-mahdi. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, the prophecy of this ayah has yet to be recognized. It has yet to be fulfilled. This ayah, will be actualized, and this prophecy we will be fulfilled upon the advent of the 12th Imam. And then what does he say? فَلَا يَبْقَى أَحَدٌ إِلَّا أَقَرَّ بِمُحَمَّدٍ There will not be a single person on earth who will not acknowledge the greatness of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah but how is that going to happen, my dear brothers and sisters? That means there is a golden opportunity for you and I to take the true image of the Holy Prophet and share it with the world. Because unfortunately, most scholars who are writing on the Prophet are non-Muslims. There are more non-Muslim authors who have written the biography of Rasulullah than Muslim authors. It's time for us, for our children, to rise to the occasion, to earn degrees, to become authors, to introduce your prophet to the world and not have others speak on your behalf. So you find that Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says, there will come a day when everyone will know the real Muhammad. 
And we have to ask Allah Azza wa to give us the tawfiq to become true ambassadors of Islam. In another tradition from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, لا يبقى على ظهر الأرض بيت إلا أدخله الله كلمة الإسلام. There will not be a single household on earth, but the true message of Islam will be delivered to them. And and what does that really mean, brothers and sisters? The majority of the world today have not been exposed to the real Islam. Islamophobia exists today largely because the majority of the world, they have been presented what? A distorted version of Islam. They've been presented with the Umayyad version of Islam, the Abbasid version of Islam. Not the real Islam that the Holy Prophet taught to his companions and his followers. So the Islamophobia stems from what? The adulteration of Islam. There's an aversion towards this faith because this is not the faith that the Holy Prophet propagated. Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam, what does he say? He says, لَوْ عَلِمُ النَّاسِ مَحَاسِنَ كَلَامِنَا لَتَّبَعُونَ If people were acquainted with the beauty of our words, they would follow us. Because the teachings of Ahlul Bayt are compatible with the fitrah, with the disposition of the human being. But people today, what Islam are they presented? The Islam of Imam al rida or the Islam of Khalid ibn al-Walid? The Islam of Ali ibn Abi Talib or the Islam of Abu Huraira? It's not the genuine, the pure Islam that the Holy Prophet was propagating in Mecca and Medina. But as I said, Malaika are not going to descend upon the earth and do the work for you. We have a golden opportunity to first educate ourselves, to take our Islamic education seriously. In the same way, we put a lot of effort in getting our secular degrees. Our parents wake us up every morning at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. Even if we're sick, even if we're not feeling well, they push us to go to school. Why? Because they want to secure our future. Learning Islam is investing in your dunya and your akhirah. It's your real retirement plan. So if we go back to the ayah, in the future, there will be what? There will be an individual who will propagate Islam in the same way, who will revive the Islam that the Holy Prophet introduced to 7th century Arabia. And that's why Imam after Imam, they say what? When they comment on this verse, Surah number 9, ayah number, what ayah number? 33. What do they say? Imam al-Sadiq, he says, Wallahi ma nazala ta'wila hadha. That this ayah, you have, you have not witnessed the actualization of this ayah. The prophecy of this ayah has yet to be fulfilled. وَلَا, وَلَا يَنزِلُ تَأْوِيلَهَا حَتَّى يَخْرُجَ الْقَائِمُ When the 12th Imam reappears, you will understand what this ayah means. فَإِذَا خَرَجَ الْقَائِمُ Listen to the words of the Imam. فَإِذَا خَرَجَ الْقَائِمُ لَمْ يَبْقَى كَافِرٌ بِاللَّهِ الْعَظِيمُ When the Imam reappears, there will not be a single atheist left on earth. Meaning what? Is the Imam going to start chopping off people's heads? No. Ahlul Bayt, they don't work like that. When I read this hadith, it amazes me. Because when the Imam reappears, atheism will be on the rise. Just as we see today, you know, when we go to our mosques, we spend so much time discussing peripheral issues. When we don't understand that the youth that are listening to our lectures have doubts about the existence of God. You want to teach them the intricacies of how to perform wudu? They don't even know if God exists. Talk about not having your priorities straight. We're teaching them which manager they should follow. We should introduce them to Allah first. That's why people fall asleep when you teach fiqh. 
Because you're teaching them ritual when they have not yet internalized ideology. The aqidah is weak. There's not going to be any interest in learning the do's and the don'ts of fiqh. That's why you find when Imam Al-Mahdi, when he reappears, he will understand the problem. He will diagnose the problem correctly. And that is what? You have to develop ma'rifah of Allah first. In Mecca, when the Holy Prophet began teaching people Islam, did he say, everyone gather around, I'm going to teach you how to do wudu properly? No. He first introduced them to Allah. The first ayah that was revealed was what? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim iqra. Bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. The discussion is about what? Tawheed. When Imam Hussein alayhi salam was bleeding on the plains of Karbala, what, were, what was his last words? One of the last words of the Imam was what? Ridhan bi ridhaq. Oh Allah, I am pleased if you are pleased. The beginning of Karbala is Tawheed. The end of Karbala is what? Tawheed. Imam al hujja when he reappears, he will see that people have become disconnected from their Lord. Mm -hmm. And he will not bring people to Islam through force and intimidation. He will rekindle their fitrah. Because brothers and sisters, I tell you something. The majority of humanity have goodness in their hearts. Mm -hmm. The majority of human beings are good. If you sit with them, if you talk to them, if you address their concerns, if you listen to their doubts, you know how many youth are afraid to even have a conversation about God's existence with their parents? Because if you question Allah's existence, what happens? You get what? The you're going to Jahannam card. Right? You know, brothers and sisters, atheists used to feel comfortable sitting with Imam Jafar al -Sad. They used to debate. Imam never made them feel inferior. He used to listen attentively to their questions, to their philosophies, and he would give rational counter-arguments. In fact, when atheists used to debate some of the students of Imam al-Sadiq, and some of his students would lose their temper, they would say, listen, do not lose your temper with us. Because we have made more bold statements to your teacher, Jafar al-Sadiq, and he always remains calm. So when the Imam reappears, the first order of business is what? Reconnecting people to God. That he will uproot the foundations of atheism. Now when we speak about the concept of the 12th Imam, do you know, brothers and sisters, if you open up and you collect all of the ahadith from the Holy Prophet and from the Imams, you would think that probably most of our ahadith would be maybe about salah, right? If you count all of the ahadith that speak about prayer and the spirituality of prayer and the significance of prayer, they number in the thousands. But do you know the topic that has the most ahadith on is what? Al-Mahdi. There are 6,207 ahadith on Imam Al-Mahdi. There is no topic in Islamic practice or Islamic theology that has been more emphasized than the topic of Sahib Al-Asri wa zaman if you count the ahadith about prayer, they're less than the ahadith about the 12th Imam. If you count the ahadith about fasting, about hajj, about akhl, it's less. So you find that the concept of the 12th Imam is an integral part of Islamic theology. Now tonight, in the brief time that I have, I want to answer two fundamental, three fundamental questions. Number one, 
Who is the 12th Imam? Number two, what is our responsibility during his ghaibah, his occultation? And number three, what are the signs of his reappearance? <laughs> I have about, what, 40 minutes, Sister Zahra? Yes. If I go over time, no, someone... No, no problem. I want to try to get, you know, we try to be democratic, right? <laughs> if I go over time, someone signal to me, I'll kindly ignore you, and inshallah, I'll apologize to you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The 12th Imam. Incidentally, brothers and sisters, the 12th Imam, even in Sunni Hadith literature, was introduced by Rasulullah. The concept of the 12th Imam did not gradually evolve at generation after generation. It was introduced by the Holy Prophet. In a famous hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, لَوْ لَمْ يَبْقَى مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا يَوْمٌ وَاحِدٌ If there were to remain only one more day in this life, what would happen? لَطَوَّلَ اللَّهُ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمُ حَتَّى يَبْعَثَ اللَّهُ رَجُلًا مِنْ وُلْدِي يُوَاطُ اسْمُهُ اسْمِي يَمْلَأُ الْأَرْضَ قِسْطًا وَعَدْلًا كَمَا مُلِئَ الظُّلْمًا وَجَوْرًا رسول الله says if there were only to remain one day, one more day until the day of Qiyamah, Allah would prolong that day until a man emerges from my progeny whose name is my name, who carries the name Muhammad, he will fill the earth with justice and equity, just as it has been filled with aggression and tyranny. Now if you think about this, brothers and sisters, can you imagine how difficult that task is? You know, if you think about it, Allah is just. He doesn't place a burden on you that you cannot bear. How difficult is it to establish Justice in your own household. How difficult is it to establish justice in your community, in your city, in your state, in your country, on your continent? Allah doesn't put a burden on someone that they cannot bear. Can you imagine the resilience of the 12th Imam? The leadership skills of the 12th Imam, his fortitude, his wisdom, that he's going to be able to fill not a city, not a, a, a state, not a, the entire world will come under his control and he will establish justice. But when you look around the world today, you may ask, isn't the world filled with injustice? You know, I'm sure after World War II, when we saw 50 million people lose their lives, people were probably thinking that, God, so much death, so much brutality. When is the Imam going to reappear? What does it mean when Rasulullah says, the earth will be filled with injustice and tyranny? You may say that the world, I mean, for God's sake, Donald Trump is the president, right? Aren't we living in a world that is filled with injustice and tyranny? Just a few days ago, there was an arms deal that was finalized. $350 billion. An arms deal. Meaning what? The most lucrative industry, brothers and sisters, is what? The military industrial complex. You know? You know there's a saying that goes, business, war is bad for business. Unless you're in the business of war. So what does it mean when Rasulullah says, the earth will be filled with injustice, with zulm? Many of us, we don't understand what type of zulm the Prophet is speaking about. How much war have we witnessed? How much genocide? It seems that Rasulullah is speaking about a specific type of zulm. There's a hadith mentioned by Shaykh Al-Tusi in his Tahdeeb. Shaykh Al-Tusi is one of our prominent ulama. And it's also mentioned in the Musnad of 
Abi Ya'la, he's a Sunni scholar. So it's a hadith mentioned in both sources. Rasulullah once said to his companions, كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا فَسَقَ إِذَا فَسَدَتْ نِسَاءُكُمْ وَفَسَقَ شَبَابُكُمْ What will be your condition when your women become corrupt and your youth become sinful? وَلَمْ تَأْمُرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَمْ تَنْهَوْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Rasulullah says, what will be your condition when your women become corrupt and your youth become sinful and you abstain from enjoining good and forbidding evil? The Sahaba, they say, وَيَكُونُ ذَلِكَ يَا رَسُولَ Is that really going to happen? We're going to get to that state? Rasulullah says, نَعَمْ كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا نَهَيْتُمْ عَنِ الْمَعْرُوفِ وَأَمَرْتُمْ بِالْمُنْكَرِ What will be your condition when you enjoin evil and you forbid what is good? The Sahaba again, they're astonished. وَيَكُونُ ذَلِكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Is that really going to happen? Rasulullah, listen to this brother and sister. He says, نَعَمْ وَشَرٌ مِنْ ذَاكَ that will happen and even worse will take place. كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُ الْمَعْرُوفَ مُنْكَرًا وَالْمُنْكَرَ مَعْرُوفًا What will be your condition when you perceive virtue as vice and vice as virtue? Meaning what? The dhulm that Rasulullah is speaking about is what type of dhulm? It's the oppression whereby your entire moral standard is upside down. What you think is good is actually evil. And what you think is evil is actually good. When the 12th Imam reappears in order for you to guarantee that you will be his supporter, you will have to know what is ma'roof and know what is mankar. And how do you know what is ma'roof and what is munkar? What is good and what is bad? What is virtue and what is vice? You have to be familiar with the ethics of the Qur'an. You have to develop a strong relationship with the Qur'an. Your, the Qur'an has to be your moral compass. The Qur'an has to be your code of ethics because the Imam is going to revive the ethics of the Qur'an. Brothers and sisters, when we speak about the 12th Imam, we have to understand that us as an Ummah, we are in the middle of a spiritual crisis. You know, when we speak about what is my responsibility during the Ghaybah, before we speak about what your responsibility is during the Ghaybah, we have to contextualize the ghaybah. We have to understand the great predicament that we find ourselves in. You know, brothers and sisters, being in a position where you don't have direct access to your imam should bother you. You know, the imam experienced two ghaybahs, two occultations. The first is al ghaybat al the minor occultation, where as an, as an ummah, we had indirect access to the imam through his nawab, through his deputies, through his representatives. That was not ideal, but it was better than no access to the ma'asun. But we are living now during al ghaybat al-kubra, whereby there is no access to the imam. And that should be something that bothers us, that makes us feel uneasy. That's why Ahlul Bayt, what do they say? When you're living during the ghaybah, Ahlul Bayt, they say, when you're living during that period where you don't have access to the Imam, Anticipate the reappearance day and night. What does that mean? What are the Imams trying to say to you when they say anticipate the reappearance day and night? It means that 
this is something that you should be thinking about on a regular basis. When you have a problem, your problem occupies your thoughts. If your car breaks down and you can't get to work for two, three days, what are you thinking about all day, every day, until you fix that problem? You're thinking about how to fix the problem. You're thinking about your car, how to repair it. Because it's not an ideal position to be in where you don't have a way to get to work. We do not have access to God's representative on earth. We are all trying to become true human beings, but we don't have direct access to an insanul kamil. We don't have access to the perfect man. You know, brothers and sisters, Mufaddal ibn Umar was one of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa With a loud salawat, can uh, men a little bit If we can ask the brothers to move forward. Rahimallah man dhakar al-qa'ima min ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ali You can come closer. I'm a nice guy, I'm very pleasant. You can come close. I'm not going to pick on you or ask you to answer questions. Are we good? Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Imam al-Sadiq salam, not only did he speak about the 12th Imam, by the way, brothers and sisters, every single Imam of Ahlul Bayt have mentioned the 12th Imam. All of the Imams, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Jawad, they, they all have traditions where they speak about the Mahdi, all of them. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, he has a hadith where he speaks about the Ghaybah, where he says, Allah, I swear by Allah, The Imam speaks about the occultation. He says, I swear by Allah that your Imam will be hidden from you for a long time. All of the Imams, they spoke about this ghaybah. You know, brothers and sisters, the ghaybah, is so important and so heartbreaking that one day one of the companions of Amir al Mu'mineen, Salawatullahi When I mention the name of Amir al Mu'mineen, I expect the Majlis to erupt. I'm with Shia, huh? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. of Amir al muminin he says, one day I saw Ali ibn Abi Talib sitting on the ground playing with dirt. He had some dirt in his hands and he was engrossed in deep thought. He says, I approached Amir al muminin and I asked him, Ya Amir al muminin what are you doing? I see you sitting alone and you seem to be thinking deeply about something. The Imam says, I'm thinking. The Imam says, Ya Amir al muminin what are you thinking about? The Imam alayhi salam, he says, I am thinking about my 11th son. And I am thinking about his ghaybah. And Amir al muminin begins to describe the condition of the ummah during the occultation. Imam al-Sadiq, going back to the hadith, he says to Mufaddal ibn Umar, لَيَأَمَوَ اللَّهِ لَيَغِيبَنَّ إِمَامُكُمْ سِنِينًا مِّن دَهْرِكُمْ وَلَتُمَحِّصَنَّ حَتَّى يُقَالْ مَا تَهَلَكْ بِأَيِّ وَادِلْ سَلَكْ The Imam says the Imam will be in ghaybah for such a long period of time that people will be tested. Their faith will be tested and some people will lose faith in the Imam. They will say, he probably died a long time ago. He probably was killed. That we don't have an Imam with us anymore. 
وَلَتَفِيغَنَّ عَلَيْهِ دُمُوعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The Imam alayhi salam, he says, the mu'mineen will cry, they will shed tears because of the pain of being separated. You know, brothers and sisters, when I say the word gharib, who do you think of? Imam al Hussein. In fact, gharib and Imam al Hussein have become synonymous. Gharib, ya madhloom karbala. But I tell you, brothers and sisters, that I truly feel sorry for the Imam of our time. In fact, I can say that Imam Sahib al Zaman is more gharib than Imam al Hussein. Why? You may say this is a bold statement. The reason why I say that is Imam al Hussein had Qasim. Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura, he had Ali al Akbar. Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the 10th of Muharram, he had Abbas. I ask you, brothers and sisters, who is the Qasim for Sahib al Zaman? Who is Ali Akbar for Sahib al Zaman? Who has the loyalty of Abbas towards the Imam of our time? Who has that type of loyalty? When Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas went to the Nile, when, when he went to the Euphrates, he didn't even drink water. Because the Imam being thirsty was a bigger problem than his own thirst. When you raise your hands in dua every day, how many of us, ask yourselves, how many of us have prayed for our Imam? If you love someone, you talk about them. Have you seen someone who's in love? They're always talking about their beloved. The beloved is always on the tongue of the lover. If you've never mentioned Sahib al-Zaman, can you claim to love him? The best spiritual advice, brothers and sisters, that I've received, it's something very simple. If you don't want to recite a ziyarah for the 12th Imam, if you don't want to recite a long dua for him, start with something small. After every prayer, say, Assalamu alaikum ya sahib al zaman. That's it. If you can do that consistently, I promise you, brothers and sisters, your life is going to change. Do you know why? In Islamic jurisprudence, when you say salam to someone, it becomes wajib for what? For the person that you're greeting to reply by saying what? Wa alaykum as salam, which means what? Peace be upon you. Which is essentially a dua. What would happen to your life if every day after every salah, you say salam to the imam, and the imam replies to you by saying, Wa alaykum as salam, where you get a dua for peace in your life from the 12th imam. I, if I, if it's dua for you, you will give every dollar in your bank account for one dua from a Muslim. We have it every day. You can say salam to him every day. But we don't take advantage. My dear brothers and sisters, all of us who are sitting here today, we need to remember that there is a story in the Quran. There is a relationship in the Quran that is analogous to our relationship with the 12th Imam. We're all familiar with the story of Yusuf in the Quran. Yes? Yusuf alayhi salam was a prophet. He was a ma'soom. His father was also ma'soom. Ya'qub. Ya'qub loved Yusuf. 
not just in the emotional way that a father loves his son. There are many fathers who love their sons, but no. The love for ya the love Yaqub has for Yusuf has a spiritual dimension to it. He doesn't only love him because he's his biological son, he's attracted to the spiritual beauty of Yusuf, the akhlaq, the devotion that Yusuf had to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Ya'qub was separated from Yusuf. When Ya'qub was no longer able to see Yusuf, what happened to Ya'qub? Allah says, وَبِيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ فَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ Ya'qub grieved, he cried. Because of that separation, he yearned for Yusuf, he longed for him until what? He became blind. We have to be like Ya'qub. We have to yearn and long for our Yusuf. In Ziyarat, in Dua and Nudba, what do we say? We say, brothers and sisters, Azizun alayya an ara al khalqa wa la tura that it pains me that I get to see everybody, but I don't get to see you. Azizun alayya an ara al khalqa wa la tura wa la asma'u laka hasisan wa la najwa. It pains me that not only do I not get to see you, but I don't even get to hear a whisper from you. What is our responsibility, brothers and sisters? During the Veiba, it's very simple. You know, sometimes we act as though there's a secret formula. One word. One word is your responsibility during the Veiba. Taqwa. You don't need to complicate. Taqwa. Be pious people. If you want to know who are the muttaqeen, there's a khutbah in Nahj al-Balagha that you need to read. Where Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam beautifully describes the pious. But if I want to simplify it in one sentence, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad. Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And the, on the last Friday before the month of Ramadan, we're approaching the month of Ramadan, when Rasulullah delivered his Ramadan sermon, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Prophet spoke about some of the best things to do in this month, charity, recitation of Quran, being good to parents, safeguarding your tongue, paying attention to what you listen to. After the khutbah, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam asks the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, ma afdalu al-a'malu fi hadha al-shah? What is the best thing? You see, we have to have the ambition of Ali. We don't only want to do what's good, we want to do what is best. Ya Rasulullah, ma afdalu al-a'malu fi hadha al-shah? What is the best thing to do in the month of Ramadan? Rasulullah says, Al-Wara' an maharim Allah. Refrain from disobeying Allah. You know, brothers and sisters, someone who does the bare minimum, just the wajibat, and they don't commit sin, they're better than the one who does wajibat and mustahabbat and reads dua Josha, but they do ghibah when there's niyaz, when there's dinner being served, right? Avoiding the muharramat. You know, brothers and sisters, if you have a boss and your boss gives you a project, he says, I want this project to be completed in one week. And you don't. You don't finish it. You finish it a month later. But then you throw this lavish party for your boss. Is your boss going to appreciate it? He says, listen. I would have preferred it if you just did and finished the project on time. It's nice that you threw a party for me, but I want you to do what I told you. 
that same boss would probably appreciate having an employee that finishes the project and gives them maybe a cup of coffee. When you fulfill your obligations, you don't need to do very much more. When Imam Al-Baqir Salawatullahi Alayhi When he saw Imam Al-Sadiq when he was young doing Tawaf, he was exerting himself to try to do so much extra mustahab. Imam al-Bakr he says to him, and he says to all of the Shias who were in his presence, he says, you don't need to put a lot of effort in doing extra amal if you have taqwa. When you abandon haram, that is the real goal. If you can abandon haram, you don't need to do much more than that to gain Allah's pleasure. That's why in Dua Kumir, what do we say? Ya Sariya Rida. Allah has not asked you to do much. Fulfill some obligations, abstain from some of the forbidden. Allah would much rather have you do that and refrain from haram rather than commit haram and recite dua kumay and go to ziyar every month. Allah says, do what I ask you. And then rely on my mercy. What are we, how are we doing on time? 8.15. Let me conclude here, inshallah, maybe during the q and I can touch upon some of the signs of the uh, reappearance. I'll conclude here, brothers and sisters. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he describes the companions of the 12th Imam. And I'm not reading this for you to make you depressed, because a lot of times when we read about you know, these companions and these righteous personalities, we think to ourselves, oh man, I'm going to hell. These are the types of people that are going to be around the Imam. I'm very far from these descriptions. Amir al muminin السلام, what does he say? He says, Inna ashab al qa'im shabah. There's a distinction made between the ulama when they speak about the return of the Imam. They say the Imam has ansar, he has helpers, and he has ashab. The Imam has many ansar in the thousands. But when it comes to his ashab, there are only 313. Listen to the description. And the Imam says, the majority of the ashab are youth. They're youth. You know, sometimes we underestimate our youth. When we run our mosques, they don't occupy board positions. We say, you know, go do your youth committee and then report back to us. Imam, his inner circle, the rulers of his government are youth. They're youth. The Imam says, "Inna ashab al qa'im shabab ala wa inna al mahdi ahsan al nas khalqan wa khulqa." Imam Amir al Mumini he says, "Imam al Mahdi will be the most attractive in physical appearance, and he will be the most noble in character." إذا قام يجتمع إليه أصحابه when he rises, his أصحاب will flock to him from all corners of the world. على عدة أهل بدر their numbers will be equal to the fighters in bed, which were how many? Three hundred and thirty. كأنهم ليوث قد خرجوا من غابات. They will be like lions emerging from the jungle. Meaning what? They will be people of courage. They will be people who are not afraid to speak out against the injustices, even if it means it's going to cause them trouble. مثل زبر الحديد They will be like iron. They will be like iron, meaning what? They'll be resilient. It's difficult to break them. It's difficult to break their spirit. They are determined, they are persistent, they are ambitious. If 
If they wanted to move mountains, they would find a way to move mountains. When they encounter problems, they don't have a defeatist mentality. They always try to find solutions even when the problems are overwhelming. They're very optimistic. فَهُمُ الَّذِينَ وَحَدُوا اللَّهِ حَقَّ تَوْحِيدٍ Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, they are the true monotheists. They are the ones who understand Tawheed. SubhanAllah, some of us when we speak about Tawheed, we think Tawheed is, there's only one God. Let's discuss something more complicated, right? I graduated from Sunday school madrasa. Shaykh, come on, Tawheed, give us something. Speak about the Raja'a, speak about something more complicated. Amir al says, these are the ones who have understood the secrets of Tawheed. Tawheed is not just an idea in your mind. Tawheed is an external reality. Brothers and sisters, you know there's a book called Manazir al sairin The Stations of the Wayfair. There's a lot of interest in Irfan today, right? Everyone wants to develop spirituality. You know, in this book, there are 100 stations of spiritual development. The first station is what? Babul Yaqwa. The station of awakening. You're spiritually asleep. When you want to begin this journey, you have to wake up. Do you know what station 100 is? Tawheed. Tawheed is not the beginning. Tawheed is what we are trying to achieve in a lifetime. That's why Imam Hussein, in his last moments, Ridhan bi Life is all about truly understanding the power of La ilaha. Amir al umri says, the Ashab of the Imam, they are the ones who understood the secret of Tawheed. لَهُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ أَصْوَاتٌ كَأَصْوَاتِ الثَّوَاكِلِ At night, at night you and I are asleep. I'm snoring at night. But them, they're crying at night in the same way that a mother cries when she loses her only child. And brothers and sisters, these are not tears of fear or tears of grief. Have you seen tears of joy? When you encounter someone that you love, have you seen a mother when she sees her son after a long separation? When a parent sees their child after a long separation? These are tears of love. This is a love relationship. At night they're conversing. They're having munajat with Allah, crying at night. They spend the portion of the night awake with their beloved. And they fast during the day because they're always trying to refine their souls. And then the Imam says, Ala wa inni a'arifu asma'am. The Imam says, I know all of their names. Imagine how noble these 313 that the Imam proudly says, I know who they are. They are known in the heavens, but they are unknown on earth. Meaning what? They're not people who promote themselves. They're not looking for recognition. The only recognition they want is what? Is recognition. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and make us among, if not the Ashab, then at least the Ansar. If not among the Ansar, we ask Allah to allow us to at least, when the Imam reappears, to know what is Ma'roof and what is Munka and not be among those who are not able to distinguish between Ma'roof and Munka. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to honor us with the ziyar of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and their shafa'ah on the day of judgment. يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآل الطاهرين. In the in the lecture, you know, before we speak about our relationship with the Imam, I think we really have to go back 
to the discussion of God. You know, you can't... It doesn't make any sense to speak about forging a relationship with God's representative on earth if I have serious doubts about God's existence. I think the first thing that we have to do is create an environment, a no-judgment environment, whereby youth feel comfortable in asking questions and expressing doubts that they have. Now, unfortunately, Western culture, you know, commends skepticism. Now, it's healthy to be skeptical, but skepticism has to be followed up with investigation. I think a lot of times our youth, when they're confronted with challenging philosophical questions, a lot of them are good at asking questions, raising doubts. You know, doubt is a good place to start, but it's not a good place to dwell. So it requires, you know, the reality is, it requires a lot of personal effort. And I think, as I mentioned, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, you know, when I was growing up, luckily I had a grandfather who used to have these conversations with me. You know, where it wasn't just autumn, because the problem is, brothers and sisters, it's as though we assume that everybody has yaqeen that Allah exists. And where all of our lectures are built on this assumption that, okay, we've already tackled God's existence, Allah is one, Quran is the word of Allah, let's really get into the, the nuanced discussions on who's the rightful khalifa after the death of the Prophet. It's like, whoa! back the truck up. We need to go back to Tawheed. We have to really have a serious conversation about God's existence because there are some leading intellectuals that, that have posed some pretty compelling arguments. You know, I, I think that we need to conduct, for example, you know, a seminar on God's existence. And perhaps, and this is an idea that I had, and I, I don't know if I discussed it with you, Sister Zahra, you know, perhaps having a weekend where we can have a series of lectures and we can give it a cool name, like No Doubt, right? We speak about the existence of God. We address all of, you know, the contemporary arguments that have been put forward. And we break up the youth into two different groups. One group is going to try to bring their minds together and come up with arguments for the existence of God. And then we have another group that's going to play devil's advocate, right? Some of the others are like, Astaghfirullah, Rabbi, wa atubu ilayhi. Devil's advocate. Devil's advocate. Because the way you reinforce your aqidah is, sometimes you have to hear the other side of the argument. And we shouldn't be afraid to have these types of sessions. Because if Islam is haq, haq should not be afraid of arguments, of questions. Rasulullah never turned away someone who came to him with a question. Imam al-Sadiq never said to his companions, by the way, be careful, don't talk to atheists. The Imam salam, on the contrary, he was very open. But before, you know, the problem is, I've met even a lot of scholars who, you know, were always, you know, there's, I don't know if you're familiar, there's a fallacy called the straw man fallacy. You know, sometimes we present atheism as some absurd notion, but a lot of times, you, sometimes you have to give credit where credit is due. There are some arguments that have been put forward by the likes of Stephen Hawking, Christopher Hitchens, you know, Richard Dawkins, that require a scholarly response. And sometimes a lot of their arguments require a certain degree of knowledge of, you know, astrophysics, you know, so I think that the first step is we have to create that type of environment. So, you know, that's why I'm more excited about giving a lecture on the existence of God than a lecture on the 12th Imam because I know that I'm speaking to youth who are scratching their heads and are saying that, you know, these are cool stories, but... I don't have any connection to this personality. Because 
this personality is holy and sacred because he's God's representative on earth. I, I still have questions about God's existence. So when you speak to me about ziyarah and dua al-ahad, you know, I don't feel it. And I don't blame them for not feeling it. Because if you don't have yaqeen that Allah exists, imam and nubu, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Yes. yes. Was um, that we don't have access to the imam of our time, um, and we are not fixing the problem. So, my, from my understanding, to fix a problem, the first step is to understand that you have a problem. Um, so, and I think this is where, where we are lacking, uh, at least myself, uh, um, understanding and identifying that I have a problem. Uh, because I could say I'm, I'm trying to, to be a good person, I'm trying to do my wajibat, to connect to Quran and to connect to Allah, do my salat on time. Uh, why should I? Why should I care about my imam? I think that's that's what, one of the problems that I have, at least, and I'm, I'm sure other people have the same problem. The, the second question is um, um, second question is so, so the next step to solve the problem is to have a plan. And I think this is also something where we are lacking. Um, I have been in many lectures, I've heard a lot of uh, talks about uh, Imam, um, how, how, you know, to get, how to get closer to him, how to connect and have access to him. Um, but because I don't have a plan, I don't, and I don't see a plan how to, how to implement it in my daily life, how to make progress, um, I think I'm, I'm not getting there. I'm not making any progress. I look at my daily life and I don't see any sign, any progress of getting close, at least the effort of getting closer to Imam or understanding the, the connection to Imam. So I'll answer your second question first. Now, let me ask you a question. And I'm not trying to uh, evade the uh, question. What is the, when the Imam reappears, What's his objective? When we understand the Imam's primary objective, we will understand how we can contribute to the Imam in achieving that objective. What is the Imam's objective? Any, any, anyone to answer this question? To establish justice. What does that mean? What, what's the meaning of justice? To put every, anything, everything in its right place. That's a philosophical answer, right? Yeah, right. What did Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam do when he became the Khalifa? What was his first order of business? To give back the served rights to their rightful owners. He tackled the problems of social justice. What did he do? When the Imam came to power, the Arab was receiving more from Baytul Mal than the non-Arab. Mm -hmm. People were being neglected. There were, for example, there's a story where Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam is walking and he sees a Jewish man, he sees a Christian man begging. The Imam alayhi salam said to his companions, what is this? You saw how many beggars? One beggar. You know, when you're the Khalifa of an empire that covers 50 countries on today's map, if you say, only one beggar, alhamdulillah, we're doing well. Right? Mm -hmm. Imam saw one beggar who's not Muslim. And he said, what? What is this? His companions say, Ya Amir al muni this is a Christian. The Imam says, I didn't ask, who is this? I said, what is this? Brothers and sisters, if we want to contribute to the Imam of our time and to help the Imam achieve his goal, we have to contribute to not only the Muslim community, but also the non-Muslim community. We have to be the voice of those who don't have advocates, even in the non-Muslim community. 
Because the Imam, the Imam's goal is not to establish justice in Muslim countries. The Imam السلام, will be the advocate of those who don't have voices. So we have to engage in a lot more philanthropic work in our communities and outside our communities. So I think that, you know, hastening the reappearance of the Imam is more than just doing ziyar and doing your side. That's important. You need that for your spiritual development. But you need to get yourself to a point where non-Muslims start to recognize the presence of Muslims. You know, if all Muslims were kicked out of the United States, which seems possible in this, in this era, right? If that were to happen, we need to be as such where non-Muslims would beg to have us back. Where they will say that, listen, we want these people back because life was better when I had a Muslim name. When I had, when I had a Muslim classmate. When I had a Muslim colleague. Bringing positive change to the people around you, irrespective of their religious creed. And that's why the Ahlul Bayt السلام, were so attractive to the masses. Because the, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, when a beggar would come to them, when someone would need help, they wouldn't say, you have a Muslim, prove to me that you're Muslim. We all know the story when Imam Amir al mumineen Lady Fatim, Imam Hazim al when they were fasting for three days, and they got that knock on the door. Who was the first one that came? Yatim. Second was Miskeen, right? The third was what? Captive. Captive. <coughs> captive. Meaning what? Non Muslim. That captive was a non Muslim. Mm -hmm. Ahlul Bayt, they felt that it was more noble to go hungry and give their food to a non-Muslim. If we are able to have that type of nobility and that type of ethics, that these are the types of actions that accelerate the reappearance of the Imam and will help the Imam establish his goal, which is universal justice. And that's why the non-Muslims that live under the Imam's government, they will, especially from Ahlul Kitab, they will be attracted to Islam. Because in the Imam's government, no one will be left behind. Everyone will be taken care of. So social justice should be our focus. And remind me what your first question was? Um, in understanding that we have a problem, why, why should I care about the Imam? Why should I, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm a good person, if I'm doing my wajibah, what, um, what benefit do I have to, to be connected to I think that's, I'm just trying to go back to see, break it down, see where my problem is. So what is the goal of the human being? What's your goal as a human being, right? Ubudiyah, right? Ubudiyah, servitude to Allah, which is actually a vehicle. You were created so you can achieve kamal. You were created so you can pursue human perfection. Human perfection is achieved through submission to Allah, right? <coughs> submission to Allah is achieved by knowing what are the do's and what are the don'ts. What, what is recommended to do and what is discouraged. Right now, you follow a marja, right? Your marja sometimes gives you a fatwa, clear cut. But sometimes what? There's ihtiyat al-jubi, ihtiyat al right? Which means what? He's not sure. When the Imam reappears, we will know God's law. We will not be issuing verdicts that are a result of our effort to know God's law. Right? Because right now, you're following a scholar who has exerted some effort in ascertaining God's law. He might be right and he might be wrong. When the Imam reappears, you will know God's law clear-cut, without any ambiguity. When you read the Qur'an now, we refer to what? Mizan, Amthal, all of it, to understand what God meant. 
These are all scholarly attempts to understand what God means. When the Imam reappears, you can find out what God means because God chose him as his spokesman. See, there's a big difference. There's a big difference between reading a scholar's understanding of an ayah and his effort to know what it means and just asking the Imam, what does it mean? So having access to God's actual laws and knowing what God meant without hesitation, without reservation, without saying possibly or maybe means that you have access to God's message unfiltered without any qualifiers. Is that clear? Describe was like a really good explanation of why we really would love to have the right now, but why should it be very important to us? While Plus, we'll all have an eight on the same day, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But why should it? What is the importance of it to us while he's in the Zabur if we can't get those clear cut answers? Can you repeat the question? Can you, can you repeat it for me too? <laughs> <laughs> Just louder. So this kind of following up on the previous sure. question, uh, you gave an explanation for like why it would be great to have the Imam with us, yeah. and why that's important to us, for us to be close to him at that point in time. But can you elaborate on why it's important for us to be close to him right now, when he can't give us those clear-cut answers? Or we can't get those clear-cut answers from him? So. <laughs> It's important for us to establish a relationship with him even if we don't have direct access to him. Because as I said, the more you mention a personality, the more you're mindful of them. And because the Imam السلام, represents an insanul kamil, you know, if you want to imitate someone, you have to be mindful of them. So by remembering the Imam, having his name on your tongue, reciting ziyarah, it's important for your spiritual development because he is the benchmark. It's also important for you to live your life in such a way where you're living your life in a way that is hastening his reappearance. I don't know, I mean, I don't know if that is a satisfying answer. It might not be a satisfying answer, but it's important for us to at least, because even even something as simple as receiving, being a recipient of his salam, has an impact on your spiritual. Because as I said, alaykum as salam, from the imam is a dua for you. And a dua for you from the imam has a profound effect on your spiritual. You don't seem like you're satisfied. <laughs> Again, I would have to probably think about it some more to maybe give a, a better answer, but... Can I ask a little time of like Imam Jaffa Sadiq? Uh, whenever the name of Imam uh, Sahabu Zaman was taken, or Qayyim, people would stand up. Like we do now, they would do it even then. Yeah. So why was that? You know, there are hadith, for example, where, at least from what I remember, Imam al Rida alayhi salam, when, when the 12th Imam was mentioned, he would stand yeah. in honor of the 12th Imam. And it's, it's really to, you know, again, the Imams may have a number of reasons why they do the things that they do, but from my limited understanding, the Imams are trying to highlight what, you know, number one, how great this Imam is, that he will achieve what prophets have been trying to achieve from the beginning of time. That the final victory of Haq over Batin will be achieved at the hands of this Imam. In fact, Imam Ja'far Sadiq, he says that if I were given the opportunity, Imam al-Sadiq says, if I were given the opportunity to witness the advent of the 12th Imam, hayati. The Imam, Imam al-Sadiq says that if I were to witness the reappearance of the 12th Imam, I would serve him. Imam al-Sadiq says, I will be his servant. Which means, brothers and sisters, we're in a very privileged position to be contemporaries of this Imam. You know, in the same way we look at the Ashab of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam with reverence, during the Ghaiba, if we are people of taqwa, we can be counted among his companions. 
And that in itself is a distinction, brothers and sisters. To be among those who held on to their Iman despite this mass deviation. You know, that's one of the reasons why it's so important to develop a relationship with the Imam. Because there are hadith that tell us that at the end of times, the believers at the end of times will be among the elite believers. That the ashab of Imam Sahib al Zaman will be superior to the ashab of all of the previous Imams. So if you can elevate yourself spiritually, and if you're among the muttaqeen in this period, that in and of itself is a badge of honor on the day of Qiyamah. That you held onto your aqidah, that you were devoted to your faith, even though you did not have access to your imam. That in and of itself is an accolade. Any other questions? So, very brief, do we have time? Yeah. So very briefly, the brother is asking about the signs of the Imam's reappearance. And this is a topic of great interest to many people. Number one, we have to understand that there are two categories of signs. We have an alamatul khasa, specific signs that speak about the occurrence of specific events. And then we have an alamatul amma, general signs, like the universality of sinning. Al alamatul khasa, specific signs, can be broken up into two categories. Al alamatul mahtuma, imminent signs, meaning events that will take place without doubt. And al alamatul mawqufa, conditional signs, which means these are things that may happen or they may not happen. The majority of the ahadith that maybe you are exposed to that speak about, you know, certain individuals are going to come to power, certain events that are going to take place, most of them are conditional. They may, they may happen, they may not happen. There are four signs, specific signs, that are known as al-alamatul mahtuma. Imminent signs, meaning there's a consensus among the ulama that these will take place before the advent of the imam. Very quickly. Number one is an nida the heavenly call. A hadith tell us that the imam السلام, will make a gradual reappearance. Meaning the imam is not just going to appear on CNN and say, I am here now. The imam is not going to reappear that. The ahadith say the imam will first reveal himself to a small number of the 313. The imams are strategic planners. The imam is not going to just appear, you know, guns a blazing. It's going to be a gradual reappearance. He's going to reveal himself to a select few. They will then spread the word that the imam has reappeared to certain key individuals throughout the Muslim world perhaps. Then the Imam السلام, will make a public declaration. So he will appear privately to certain individuals. They will pave the way. They will start informing individuals that the Imam has made contact, he has reappeared. Then between Maqam Ibrahim and the Kaaba, the Imam will publicly announce. There will be a call, a heavenly call. لَقَدْ ظَهَرَ مَهْدِيُّ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ The Mahdi has reappeared. The traditions say it will be a heavenly call. What is meant by heavenly call? We don't know. People around the world in all languages will hear this call. Perhaps there are certain superpowers that will say, you know, this is an, an Iranian, you know, conspiracy. We don't know how the world is going to respond. And the Imam is going to reappear. It's going to be a gradual duhu. So some hadith say this will happen on Friday, the, the private reappe uh, reappearance. And then the public reappearance, will, the announcement according to some traditions will take place, some hadith say, Saturday on the 10th of Muharram. There will be a year where the month of, the 10th of Ashura will fall upon a Saturday and the Imam between Maqam Ibrahim and the Kaaba, that announcement will be made, number one. 
Number two, Khuruj al-Sufyani, the advent of Sufyani. Who is Sufyani? This requires a lecture in and of itself. I'm so used to speaking into, uh, I'm speaking into this, I don't forget that I have the microphone in mind. Sufyani will, re will appear. There's a debate. Is Sufyani literally from the progeny of Abu Sufyan? It's possible. Is Sufyani someone who has the ideology of Abu Sufyan, which is what? I will pretend to be Muslim because it serves my own personal agenda. Sufyani, according to some reports, will have a very sophisticated army. They will conquer many uh, area regions of the Middle East. You know, when Daesh appeared, everyone was saying that this is Sufyani. If you read the descriptions of Sufyani and his army, Daesh is a mosquito compared to the military sophistication of Sufyani. It seems that Sufyani will probably be supported by super, super power, certain superpowers. Allah A'lam. 15 months before the Zuhur of the Imam, Sufyani will so make an advent. We are going to the Sunni NATO. That's going to start. Yeah. Again, we, don't, I, we can't say anything with 100% certainty, but these are the descriptions that are given. Now, so this will happen 15 months before the Zuhur of the Imam. So this is number, number two, number three. Number three, so this shows us that when the Imam reappears, there will be at least an attempt to have a military confrontation. Sufyani will mobilize his army towards Mecca, where the Imam will be, or Medina. And if you're looking at this confrontation from a material lens, you will think that Sufyani will crush Mahdi. Because if you look at the numbers, outnumbered, this Sufyani is backed by certain superpowers, it's going to be imminent defeat. But the third sign will take place. Sometimes when we look at an equation, we forget the most important element of that equation is Allah. When Fir'aun was at the height of his power, Allah drowned him in the, in the Red Sea. When Saddam was at the height of his power, he was pulled out of a rat hole. The third imminent sign is what? Al-Khasfu bil bayda The earth will swallow Sufyani and his entire army. Meaning what? It seems that there will be some type of natural disaster that will obliterate this army. Sign number four and five is Khuruj al-Yamani. And number five is Khuruj al-Khurasani. Yamani and Khurasani, there are many, you know, those who speculate that it's, there are certain individuals. Again, we don't know who these individuals are. The point is these two camps, these two powers are supporters of the Imam. The Ahadith say Yamani and Khurasani and the 12th Imam, they will appear in the same year, on the same day, in the same year, in the same month, on the same day, the 12th Imam will find support in the army of Yamani and Khurasani. So you find that there are individuals during the time of Ghayba who are actively waiting for the Imam. The infrastructure is already built for him, meaning they're not just sitting on their hands and just waiting for the Imam. They're actually building institutions that will serve the Imam. The Imam السلام, is establishing a global government. He needs professionals. He needs pious professionals. He needs pious doctors, pious engineers, pious policy makers, right? He needs people who are professional and pious, which is unfortunately a very rare combination. And then the final, I think I conflated uh, uh, Khurasani and Yaman. The fifth is Qatl al-Nafsu zakiyya 15 days before the Zuhur of the Imam, 
The Ahadith say a pure soul will be slaughtered between Maqam Ibrahim and the Kaaba. In front of the Kaaba, someone, we don't know, the identity of this person is not revealed. Nafsu Zakiyah, the Ahadith say, a pure soul, a very noble individual, will be slaughtered mercilessly in front of the Kaaba. Fifteen days after that, the twelfth Imam will be. So these are al alamatul mahtuma, the imminent signs of the reappearance of it. Does it say anything about uh, Israel? Does it say anything about Israel? Yeah. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything specifically that mentions it. The point is, anyone who is perpetuating injustice in the world at a macro or micro level, the Imam السلام, will speak out against them. They will be the opponents of the Imam. You know, sometimes, you know, the injustices are coming from countries that are claiming to be Muslim. So the Imam السلام, you know, labels are not important to the Imam. The Imam السلام, if he sees dhulm, he's going to speak out against it, he's going to uproot it. Even if there are flags saying la ilaha illallah, he's going to implement the real meaning of la ilaha illallah. Yes. Uh, it's, it's kind of a hard question, but uh, what is the Present it, but I feel like there's a lack of confidence in our as Shia, our creed, or Aqidah, because of sort of a uh, leader that's missing or hidden uh, from us. So, what can we, all of us people in this room, and you know, Shia, do to uh, strengthen our confidence in our creed? You know, I think. The answer to that question lies in, in the institution of Marjiriya. You know, brothers and sisters, if you look at the Sunni world today, power is decentralized in the Sunni world. If a Sunni Mufti wants to mobilize millions of Sunnis, I say good luck to you. It's not going to happen. But in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we have an 86-year-old man living in Najaf who gives a fatwa and is able to assemble an army to fight Daesh in 24 hours. That is power, brothers and sisters. I think that if we understand, and the enemies of Islam, they recognize this. That's why those who want to weaken Shia Islam, what do they do? They try to disconnect the masses from the Maraja. Because the moment you sever, you sever that connection, you have weakened Shi'ism. So, having an Imam who's in Ghayba could actually be seen as a point of strength. You know, the enemies of Islam, they say that there are three things that the Shia have that is the source of their strength. Number one, Marjiriyah. They have centralized power. A fatwa is issued, millions can be mobilized. And we've seen this with our own eyes. Number two, the Shias have Imam al Hussein. Salawatullah. I know Christians, when they read about the tragedy of Imam al Hussein, they say that if we had Hussein, if we had this, we would take over the world. The story of Imam Hussein alayhi salam is the most inspiring, heartfelt story of moral sacrifice in human history. Imam Hussein is so powerful that even someone who does not pray someone who drinks, someone who does drugs, Imam Hussein is that piece of rope that pulls him to the masjid one time a year. Believe me, brothers and sisters, Imam Hussein is the hope of people who have drifted away from Islam. You know, sometimes 
People have drifted so far away, you need a long rope to pull them back. Imam Hussein السلام, is that long rope. There are people who you never think would ever become religious. They attend the majlis of Imam Hussein and literally their lives change. How many sisters wore the hijab because of the majlis of Imam Hussein? How many people started praying because of the majlis of Imam Hussein? How many people lost children and they were manically depressed and then when they hear the story of Imam Hussein it gives them strength. This is number two. Number three, the twelfth Imam. In Western literature, you find that all stories usually have tragic endings. But in Shi'ism, we understand that what? al aqibatul lil muttaqin That Shi'as are optimistic. Because no matter how dark the times are, we know that what? That the earth will be inherited one day by the righteous. No matter how difficult the times are, that Imam Sahib Zaman is the source of hope. You know, it's interesting. We all know that conversation between Allah and the Malaik. When Allah created the human beings, the first ones to protest were who? Malaika. Are you going to place on earth a representative who's going to shed blood and cause mischief? What does Allah say? Allah was the first one to defend the human being. What does Allah say? He doesn't go into details. He says, well, the angels only know part of the story of man. The story of man is like a movie. You saw a few scenes of bloodshed and barbarianism and genocide. But the end of this movie is what? The victory is with the pious. Allah says, I know what you don't know. I know that from the progeny of this Adam that you see, there is a man who will revive my message and he will create a utopian society on it. So the 12th Imam, in fact, is a source of hope on the contrary. Any experience the Zawr of Imam, you know, no longer alive in this world? I'm glad you asked that question because I have a hadith for you. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala. How many of you guys have a copy of Mafatih al Jinan in your homes? Raise your hand, up high. Or on your phone app. Everyone should have their hands. There's a dua called Dua al Ahd. It's recommended to recite every morning. It requires a lot of discipline, right? Imam, there's a hadith that Shaykh Abbas al Ummi mentions. From the sixth Imam, so these are not my words, it's not the words of Shaykh Abbas al Ummi. Imam al Sadiq is saying, Man da'a ila Allah ta'ala arba'ina sabahan bihad al ahad. Every morning you make a covenant with the Imam. There's a bay'ah that you have with the Imam. If you recite this covenant every morning, for 40 days, this number 40 is a recurring number in the Islamic tradition. It seems that if you do something consistently for six weeks, it becomes a habit. You will be among the helpers of the Imam. The brother is asking now, what if I die before the Zuhul? The Imam, he says, if you die before the zuhur of the Imam, أَخْرَجَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مِنْ قَبْرِهِ Allah will resurrect such an individual from his grave. You may say, this is going to happen. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, it's not difficult for Allah to resurrect a human being. The one who has created a universe that has 500 billion galaxies and counting, 
resurrecting a human being is not an issue. Allah will resurrect such a person. Every word that you recite, a thousand hasanat, and Allah wipes away a thousand sins. Allah is kareem. This ahad takes a few minutes to recite it. If you commit yourself to it for 40 days, the Imam السلام, says you will be among the Ansar of the Qa'an even if you depart this world before his reappearance. It's only, I think, is there a question in the back? Yes. specific example because because what I'm thinking at least you know a lot of youth ask me for example when 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 homosexuals people from the homosexual community are discriminated against or they're mistreated youth ask me are we allowed to to show up and to speak out against you know the injustices that they are facing now the answer that I give and I want you to listen very carefully we have to make a distinction between a homosexual as a human being and homosexuality as a lifestyle. Now what does that mean? In Islam, you do not have the right to take the law into your own hands. You're not a government and we don't live under an Islamic government. So therefore, if someone is engaging in behavior that is contrary to the Sharia, you as a citizen do not have license to implement a punishment on anyone. That has to be understood. Implementation of punishment when certain laws are broken, that's the job of the state, it's the job of the government, whether it's a secular government or an Islamic government. That has to be understood. Secondly, if someone, if someone says that, listen, I'm a homosexual, and I want to be treated fairly. I want to be treated as a human being. We say, listen, we will treat you with respect because our deen teaches us that we treat all human beings with respect. But that doesn't mean that that should translate as me condoning homosexuality as a lifestyle. You can treat someone with respect, but also say that, listen, in our religious tradition, that is not a lifestyle that is compatible with the Islamic tradition. So that has to be understood. You know, when we look at the Holy Quran, when Allah sends Musa to speak to Fir'aun, who's Fir'aun? Fir'aun is a man who claims to be God. Fir'aun killed how many infants? Many. So he's a narcissist. Someone who's the, he's a self-proclaimed God. Someone who has slaughtered countless innocent people. Allah says when you interact with Him, speak to Him with kindness. Be gentle with Him. Allah doesn't say condone His policies. Speak out against Him, but do it with akhlaq. 
So we have to be very careful, brothers and sisters, that when we speak out against injustice, we have to be careful that we're not being misunderstood. You know, there are a lot of youth that's, that told me, Sheikh, you know, can we go out wearing, you know, rainbow shirts to express our solidarity with, with that community? You have to be very careful. If that's interpreted as condoning that lifestyle, then it's not permissible. It's not permissible. You cannot compromise principle in this for the, in the name of solidarity. That has to be very... In the same way they argue that they have a right to live this lifestyle, we also have a right to say this is not compatible with Islam. So there are rights on both sides. You have the right to do whatever you want in your privacy. We also have the right to say this lifestyle is not compatible with the teachings of Islam. You can say you don't have the right to physically assault. As a Muslim, you have the responsibility to say you don't have the right to physically assault someone who's a homosexual. Islamically, you don't have a right. But that doesn't mean you condone that lifestyle. There's a fine line that has to be understood. Sister, I don't know if I answered your question. I figured that that's what the question was, but you know. Yes. Salu ala Muhammad.